Dancing boy I had a stuffed fox That I played with He was a foxy Playful Little toy He created A powerful Myth As I grew older That fox stayed with me racism, classism, and the flood of 27. We've kept the good stuff, like good marriages and hard-working men and women, sort of. And we made stuff up. Yep, we made stuff up. I mean, come on, our animals talk. We can proudly proclaim that most of this production is pure boulder dash. In the 1980s, the callous occasional players made stuff up too. They created all ro roads lead to Babel Corner, a historically inaccurate, politically un incorrect, musical history of Maple Corner. And the show was a hit. People came from as far as Kent's Corner to see the <laughs> show at the, at the Maple Corner Community Center. The critics raved. The, the show made mention of Elgin Man but there was far too little about him in the script. And today, we're going to, we're going to remedy that, late, that major lapse. With that, let's roll. It's 19... 
25 in Maple Corner. Z Some people call it Maple Corner. Z Vermont. <laughs> department store of Maple Corner. The ladies will shop till they drop at the daylight department store. Men, they'll find their hunting gear, their accessories, their sundries, whatever sundries are, and their dry goods at the daylight department store. Need something for your Sunday special? You can always find it at the Daylight Department Store of Maple Corner. <laughs> For instance, Par Arnold, Arnold Pettibone. We thought it would be fun to create a villain, so we made up one. <laughs> Afternoon, Arnold. What brings you out on a sunny, beautiful August afternoon like this? Just doing my job, Elgin. No need to appear fearful. Fearful? <laughs> Me? Fearful, Arnold? Now, why would I be fearful of you? Because you've been neglecting the regulations again. Ah. Read section three, part B, of your retail license, Elgin. You've been selling raw milk again. <laughs> and you will be fine. I will see well and good to that. Good day. <laughs> 
Eldon had become restless in the years that he and, and Florence ran the store, and Elgin was always full of surprises. I want to sell the store. And then do what? Use the proceeds to procure 117 West County Road. You know the place up there with the big blue bar? They want to sell. Good Lord. I want to buy 50 head of cows and hire some men to milk them. Ah, really? I want a farm. A farm? But I don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> what? I want a farm, a garage, and the Maple Connor Post Office. Good Lord, Elgin. He wanted to sell the store, but keep the Maple Corner Post Office. That way he could sort of keep a handle on the situation around town. He could plot his real estate dealings from that viewpoint. I'm going to know who's doing what, but I won't be tied down to a normal job. Sure, that real estate was the way to go. He 
he got into it in a big way. He put all the property around Curtis Bond. Curtis Bond, and that's the way I see it. I'll buy him all the land that I can. I'll go to a bank and get me some debt. And that's my ever loving plan. Yeah. 
the 1920s, automobiles started to be affordable. Belgium put a gas garage when there used to be new horses and in violation of a non-competing agreement with Mr. Lackey, whom he'd sold the store, he put in a gas station too. <laughs> so he liked to work on cars. He was always looking for ways he could make, he could connect with people, especially people with disposable income. <laughs> in the eyes of Florence was his acquisition of a parrot, and that parrot could talk. <laughs> Mrs. Book, the school marm, often took her pupils up to the man's house so they could see the parrot. All right now, children, let's line up. All right, you back there. All right, you now.
wouldn't get a good look at you. Uh, let's see. You must be a Morse and a Robinson and a Fitch and a Morse. Who are you, sweetheart? I'm a little singleton girl, ma'am. <laughs> All these new families moving in, it's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> Look at you, Sally Ann. You're growing like a weed. <laughs> in your shins, or you'll get inflammation of the bowels. <laughs> now that's a proper young lady. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Elgin, they've come to see the parrot. Well, stone five feathers. Here's the parrot right here. Well, what does she respond to? You got to prod her. It's not Parrot. Her name is Polly. Polly want a cracker? Oh, now you've gone and made her antisocial. Florence, the Parrot won't do what she's supposed to do. We've got to jump into action. All right, then. You know what to do. Do everything I do just before I do it. I'll be right behind you.
Nixon had his thinking cap on, it was 1927, and people up north were asking, how can we get a piece of the Florida action? A uh, railroad car, car, car could get you there in three days. Heck, only a week with an automobile. I've been thinking of going to Florida, Herman. Oh yeah, because uh, it's very pretty down there. And warm, too. It ain't too pretty up here in February, Irvin. Florida in February is pretty. Well, I've never been. Well, I haven't been either, but I think I might just take my automobile and go there. Well, I've never been. You want to come by any <laughs> chance? Holy smokes, look at uh, uh, That's a good idea. I think it'll take us a week to get there from here. A week once we're there from here to be there. And then a week to get back here from there. Uh, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but I really need to talk to my wife. What do you have to talk to her for? You need to get her permission to spend all the hiding money you earn from all your hard labor? We've got to get down to Miami. There's acres of land for sale. They're real cheap. We need to get a parcel of people together. They can all chip in and make a real effort. Look, I heard you. Well, I'm going to get the Yeah. 
Now, the people at Montpelier gathered all their money get together and gave it to Elgin and Irwin, who took it down to, to Florida to buy land. Bye. 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 Hey, we'll be back. We'll be back on the piece of my <laughs> They were they were right. They went down and bought a piece of property in Miami. Algen bought some wild animals. Uh, Algen bought some alligators too. Put them in a his wild animal farm. He, ca he carried them home in a back seat. Oh, thank God. Okay, the alligators are going to stay in the car. Why? 
The alligators are staying in the car. <laughs> Talk about Vermont? Yep. <laughs> Have you heard about Vermont? Yeah. Did you hear how cold it gets? Yeah. Welcome to freeze today. Yeah. Yeah.
see you all in 15 minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Great Depression was just around the corner. The Roaring Twenties were now history. I got us a couch today. <laughs> How did that happen? I sold Mr. Hardy a lot down to Curtis Pond for a nice couch. He says he doesn't have any money, but he has a nice couch. I said, John, he's going to bring it over tomorrow. Such a deal! Such a deal! <laughs> that parrot's been hanging out with the alligators. <laughs> I know times are tough, but, well, is it a new couch? He says no one comes over to sit on it anymore. He's a bachelor. He's building a house down to Curtis Pond. He won't have room for the couch there. So he says he'll bring it over tomorrow. I asked you if it was a new couch, Elgin. Is it new? Sort of. How old? Uh, it's 10 years old. I got to get to the post office. market to come back to where it was. Not to mention everybody else. I know. We did buy it the worst time ever. We should probably sell it. Oh, heck. Well, what does the Boston Inquirer say about it? The Boston Enquirer says it's an economic crash. I'll say. Even worse, the pulpit's printed out. 
those alligators when we was down to Florida. <laughs> That's all you can say? Well, you helped. I mean, you was right there in the front seat. Yeah, I tried to ignore them. You did mind your own peas and tomato, uh, peas and cues. You know, uh, those alligators, they don't like too much attention. I'm right? not listening to this. I, I, I'll be back. Oh, yeah, I'll see you at my new business. It's called Man's Wild Animal Farm. You can get up close and personal with all the wild animals. Have you ever seen a beaver? Have you ever seen a mink? Have you ever seen a bear? You can see a fox, too. You can see them all at the Wild Man's, man's Wild Animal Farm. <laughs> The people of, of Maple Corner carried on, and the Great Depression came and went. And truthfully, Maple Corner didn't see any big difference. <laughs> Elgin worked on his wild animal farm, and his mind keeps on ticking. I want to build a bridge across Curtis Park. What in the world? Then people could go out there and buy real estate. You know, I figure there could be maybe one car at a time could go over this bridge. I figure there could be maybe 10 houses for sale out there. Oh, Lord. Something like that. You know, there's this fella over to the Widens department. He's been keeping a real close eye on me. I don't think he likes me very much. Arnold Pettibone is his name. Ken Pettibone. Yeah, I know him. You know him. I know him all right. Uh, try to get me to put down on paper what I'm going to do with my old land. Always trying to stir things up. He wants me to, too. You know, it's a brand new era. What I do with my property is my own business. That's right. That's right. It's a brand new era. Can't own a porcupine, can't own a man, can't own a beaver, no fox. But the property values on Curtis Pond are going way up. You can see it. The people will come from Boston to see how simple and beautiful life can be. The women can stroll while the men chop a tree. And you can skate on the pond when it gets wintry. And New York's a sin, it's so crowded and gritty. The ladies are glad to get out of the city. And the pond is just sitting there, looking so pretty. I'll sell them some land. That's the point of this ditty. <laughs> and it's my land. Don't need to go to committee. <laughs> and one, two, three. He built the bridge. The bridge to paradise. Huh. Yes, indeed. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. See the new bridge to Curtis Park. I put markers where all the houses will be. You can put your little house right where those markers are, and then sleep until noon on your Saturday mornings, and then take your grandchildren across the bridge to Curtis Park. Now I want you to walk across that bridge. Come on, be the first people ever to walk across the bridge. Be the first on Curtis to cross my bridge.
centered around men. In the evenings, people would often gather around the parlor and tell sto stories. This evening, we have June 
Morse in our house. Let's <laughs> give it up for her. Here's gonna, she's gonna, some stories. As many of you know, I grew up on a farm about a mile and a half north of Maple Corner, uh, back in the 30s and 40s when money was not plentiful. But mother had a big garden. She canned hundreds of quarts of fruits and vegetables, and we had pigs and cows and chickens. And uh, speaking about canning meat, there was also quite a considerable amount of venison that got canned at our place. Mother had the chickens, so she sold eggs. She made butter, sold butter, cream, milk, sometimes raspberries. So not just our family, but almost all the families that went to Maple Corner School, the kids were from farms. And I'm sure all the other mothers did the same sorts of things that, that my mother did. Sybil and I walked that mile and a half from home down to Maple Corner School many, many times. And our teacher for the first four years was Mildred Bullock. Mildred, as you might, some of her students might have mentioned, would be cross. Most of us can. She was a wonderful teacher. She took very seriously the idea that she needed to give us the basics that we were going to be using all our life. Uh, it just so happens that Mildred's daughter is here today, uh, this evening, and, and I think maybe we could entice her to get up and tell us a story or two about growing up in Maple Corner, about the man. <laughs> came out, that hat, <laughs> we reminded, uh, Elgin wore a hat similar to that. And he walked like this, always trying to get there a little Well, he will, and he was always in a hurry, yeah. Yes. yeah. And Florence also. Well, yes, there was always something to do. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot to do. Absolutely. And she did it. <laughs> they both did. He had the inspiration and the imagination to all sorts of situations, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't know if uh, Elaine was a fan of Elgin's. Oh, I like. Yes. Oh, you. oh, yes. Everybody liked Elgin. Yeah, he was. He was a, you know, very pleasant man. Everybody liked him. And when I was in high school, I worked in the store, and he'd come in, and he hadn't been very well. And uh, he came in the store one day and he said, well, where do we go from here? <laughs> we didn't have an answer. <laughs> and uh, one, one thing about Flossie, she made, uh, she, they always had a lot of cats around. And she, every morning she made uh, Johnny cake for the cats. Well, one morning she couldn't remember how to make Johnny cake. So that's why I have recipes stuck up on the cupboard door. You never know when that day will come. <laughs> yeah, they were great people. Everybody liked them. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything else I don't know. Well, I'll talk a little bit about it. The, uh, the animals. And they really did have all those animals. The uh, the backyard out here was fenced in with a tall fence, and there was a whole herd of deer out there, which we could see when, when we were walking to school. So there were the deer, and I don't know how Elgin managed to get them and get them inside that fence, but he did. He was a creative, imaginative sort of person, I think. And uh, sometimes, did you think of something else you'd like to say? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we'd sell seeds in the spring. I suppose we raised money for books or something like that. And there was always a rush to see who could get to the, 
to the man's first, because if we got there and got in the house, we were going to see that parrot. And here, <laughs> here the uh, Polywood Cracker telephone, Elgin, Elgin telephone. <laughs> Susanna sounds just like him. <laughs> so there were the deer. There was the parrot. I never saw the alligators, but I have no doubt that they actually did come out of the back of the car from Florida. And the, the animal that was most intriguing to me was the bear. I mean, it was so huge. I was not quite as tall then. And the bear, I'm sure, was twice as tall as I. And seeing that bear stand on his hind legs, drinking a soda. <laughs> that, that's a, a, a treat I will never forget. So. School was wonderful. The, the kids were, I think, basically pretty well behaved. I don't know if it was Mrs. Bullock or, or Mrs. Daly that started the flower contest. Do you know, Elaine? No? But we had a flower contest every spring. And uh, contests, you know, competitions, always inspiring. And it was uh, really our nature study and science and we learned I think 60, 70 different kinds of flowers that we could find and we could be out in the woods totally unsupervised for an hour or so during the, the noon time uh, and not very little happened that wasn't, I do remember one incident. <laughs> Lucille Graham and I were out at the, the sugar, uh, sugar house way out in the woods, the Fitch's Sugar House. And in back of the sugar house, there was a little outhouse. We were examining it and trying it out a little bit. It seemed a little bit wobbly. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was no one in it. <laughs> but thinking about, I mean, Elgin had these inspirations and decided to do all sorts of strange, unusual things. Uh, and I think that tradition has followed through with this house. Think about the people that were here. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Florence, I mean, she was very kind and, and encouraging and brought children into the house. Anna Remick continued that. She, she had children in the house, and uh, she worked with foster children, and she was very kind to children. Uh, and one more, a dear friend of mine, Kathy Thomas, lived in the apartment. <clears throat> when she left there, she and her husband, Jack, went up to Hardwick. And there, they took in as many as 14 seriously disabled children and took care of them. Creativity, well, who knows? I mean, it was Chris Miller, quite a sculptor, quite an artist, quite inventive, inspiration. Did, did that get handed down from Elgin? I don't know, maybe it did. And then, this guy here. <laughs> conviction and energy to pull it off. And he has done that. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. when they're swimming so frantically to avoid the alligator. <laughs> but I think I got good news for you. What day is it? Thirsty. Thirsty? I'm thirsty too. Let me sell you a glass of lemonade for 10 cents. I said Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Well, I was confused the way your New Jersey accent is overlaid with your attempt to sound like a Vermont. <laughs> but Thursday, Thursday is goat special day. You could buy my goat for 50% off today only. Normally, 
$25 today. You do the math. $12.50. I'll take it. Keep the chance. Oh, thank you so much. You'll find the goat right over there. Just pick it up and enjoy. <laughs> anything for a dollar. Well, not anything. He makes his hand on per certain points. <laughs> I'll get him. Imagine, he put alligators in Curtis Pond. He's got a pet raccoon, a whole lot of deer. There is pets. Virginia ran out of deer, so Elgin Man called the warden of that state up and delivered 50 deer to him. He never called any official up here. Imagine! <laughs> For you. <clears throat> well, it has come to our attention that you have delivered Vermont deer to Virginia. Well, uh, they got none and we got plenty. That's not the point. <laughs> they got none is the point. <laughs> well, enough of your madness, Mr. Man. You know, I was just thinking, you know, if they got none, and they now have 50, pretty soon the deer will have babies, and they'll have 100, 1,000, 50,000. Which reminds me, what do you get when you cross 50 deer with 50 hogs? I don't know. 100,000 bucks. <laughs> the Vermont Wildlife Agency. Who are they? Who are they? Yes, who are they? They, they are the Agency for Wildlife. Anytime you trap or shoot or move a deer across the state line, you need to report it. I did not know that. Well, that's one of your problems. That's one of my problems, eh? Let me show you another problem I have. All right, I can look at problems. I can always look at problems. Well, come right this way, please. Down here? Yes, down here. <laughs> yes, keep coming now. Making steps? Yes, they've been a little bit old and modest here. <laughs> well, then uh, there's going to be a problem here. Now, when you come over here, watch out for that water trough. I don't want you falling in. <laughs> and I won't want you to be going, Mr. Man. Don't kick the bucket. <laughs> something that really actually freaks me out because they're always like, what? What are you? Uh, actually, I need to get to that because the reason I, I need to deal with this now and the, the therapist that came, that comes to the farm for all the animals says I need to face my fears and I, I react too angrily, too quickly. And um, she thought, 
that perhaps, because I act out all the time, she thought maybe show business would be the proper venue for me. So I said, OK. And I got an agent. And uh, it's, it's weird, because like right away, I get this gig in well, Maple Corner. I mean, I live right around here. So that was pretty good. And then, so I get that gig from it, but I want to. He says it is going to be like a really big show, and I look at who's in the cast, and I think I want in. So I audition. I'm the only bear that tries out. So I get a female. I get a female character, and I'm thinking, okay, I will stretch my range, like De Niro did when he got fat for Raging Bull, and and I I thought, you know, what can I do? Well, I want to be this. I want to be a strong, feminine. But, but sort of a, ephemeral and delicate. And, and so I thought the bow is, is about is what I came up with. For, which reminds me, Carl, you're going to have to help me, because the thing about my performances is I, I, I don't get jokes too much. So you're going to have to help me by doing that thing you've been doing. I hear once it makes people laugh when you do that. <laughs> That's it. OK. Oh, by the way, this is Carl Miller, everybody. I don't know if you had a chance to skate on the skates tonight for me. And of course, the lovely Sid Morris, <laughs> keeping, it, keeping us all honest. One of the many Morrises who are still just swirling languidly in this hypnotic halcyon, this creamy maple vortex of <laughs> idyllic Vermont. And then, then his, his mom, they're always together, you know. I saw them skipping down the hill together uh, to the store just a little while ago. She, she wanted to play the piano because they could be close. Security said six feet. Gave them, she gave her the authority for six feet of space. That looks good. No. See? No. Here's the thing, though, because my mother just left me wandering in the woods. That's <laughs> why so I guess I'm in this constant snarling thing. It's really hard to go out, you know, rolling around down the hill the way you've seen cubs do. And I look up, oh, you see that dead? You see that dead? It's like, she's gone. And I thought, wow, no wonder I'm so messed up. So then I, then I started to, so, so I thought of some jokes. And, and this is the one that came to me. You might have heard it. Um, I don't get it. And it's real. I haven't done this now. Oh, by the way, I'm Sally. I'm Sally the Bear. And I'm really happy to be here for three great nights at the Blue Barn in Maple Corner. Um, yeah, this is my last and final night. I, I've seen the script. Believe me, I'm not sure I like where it's going. But the thing is, I want, I want to, to do this for you because I have to face my fear. People freak me out, and I'm going to tell you a joke, OK? I don't get it. It's about the two muffin joke. You might have heard it. I'm going to do it quickly. Uh, two muffins in the oven. One says it's getting hot in here, which makes it makes sense to me. And then the other one goes, um, a talking muffin. Uh, oh, a talking muffin, and then that, that's it. And I, I feel like it doesn't really get into the, the deep thing, you know, that, that sort of, um, uh, what do you call it? It's like, it's like the critical event that we, that we mean, that, that life is. I mean, where is the humor in that? So I, I, I made it a little bit different. I, I, I thought I'd make it like brownies. And I, and I decided, I've done it a couple of times. It seems to be pretty successful. I, I want to make the pot brownies tonight. So these, they're in the oven together. And then, of course, the, the first one has to say the, the line, because that, that has how he sets it up. Um, it's getting hot in here, OK? The other one says, this time, I am so baked. <laughs> and so he, then the other one says, like, what? Wait a minute. Did you say something? And indeed, he had said something. And so they, they talked well into the night, and they got really close. They found out that some of his mother was from like a Midwestern mill, and, and some of the walnuts were from Georgia, and he had some walnuts that were from Georgia. And they became really, really close, and then they faced this incredible existential dilemma because, of course, 
They're in an eight inch brownie can and they're gonna have to get cut up and who's gonna go with who and what is gonna happen and it just becomes more than I can stand. So then, and here comes the punchline. Um, and so then who comes in? People. A person comes in with a knife and just like cuts it all up and, and like, that's it. <laughs> Now, yeah, so, you know, people are people. I, I, I hate people. <laughs> oh, are there any people in, in the audience tonight? <laughs> I see some hands. Uh, okay, I don't know what I'm dealing with here. But the thing is, Elgin's okay. He, he does a lot for us. He got me a therapist. It's got to be this far, because I wouldn't have been able to come out here without a little help from my friends. And Elgin's a friend of mine, even though we have our issues. <sighs> and I do want to get serious for a second here, if you'll bear with me. <laughs> Carl. I forgot to tell you about Jimmy V. Jimmy V. Yeah. He's not addressing me with his eyes looking at steaks because he doesn't do that kind of thing. Not a hunter. Thank you, Jimmy. <sighs> me and most people, we don't get along. Most people just don't understand me. They think I eat humans. They got it all wrong. I only eat the stuff that they hand me. Now, I'm a big gal, and I do like to roar, and if I get hungry, I'll show it. And I'm also quite curious. I love to explore, but I can't, cause I'm tired, and they know it. All right, that's it. This is an old kind of living. I know what I'm going to do. Should have thought this a long time ago. Could you hold this, please? Ah! Ah!
meeting, an executive meeting. The rabbit calls the meeting to order. The deer and the raccoons and the fox have their say, and the mink makes the final point. scene with Mr. Pennybone. In a way, Elgin seemed stuck in the old world, in the old ways. It's a damn shame. Can't own a deer, can't own a porcupine, can't own raccoon, can't own a fox. It's a different Vermont. It's a different world. It's a different Vermont. <laughs> Has 
certain needs. Is it all together?
75 years from now? Who can see? Who can say? No, we can never tell and we can never stay. Well, it's not quite Maple, Maple Corner City, is it now? It isn't. But life goes on and Elgin and Florence have over the last 75 years faded from the memories of most folks here in Maple Corner. I know some of our neighbors who remember them, but now that you've seen this, well, what I mean is to say is that we hope this little production of ours has helped keep Elgin, these two colorful individuals, Elgin and Florence Mann, alive in the memories and the and hearts of a new generation of big cornites. Sure, we've made st most of this up, but still, the, the, the important thing is to remember is our attitude, which they've also made up. <laughs> We don't think Elgin and Florence would let any of the little things like failure stand in their way. No, by gum. In our imaginations, they always looked on the bright side. Say, what's that I hear? Sounds like there's music coming across the way from Cameron Crawford. 